this onto the platform. So welcome to this um, uh, seminar, which is the first seminar in 2021, which is um, uh, directly being uh, given by the um, Center, um, the SOAS Center for uh, of World Christianity, which um, uh, is uh, being, um, well, which co which uh, supports other centers uh, with an interest in world Christianity. As you've seen, um, we've, um, uh, uh, we ad advertise each other and that's also the way it should be. Um, the, we're taking advantage of the COVID situation that we're all online, but I would very much like to continue in the same vein with um, live um, seminars that are actually projected into the universe. And um, uh, then, this recording will be uh, stored, permanently stored on the SOAS YouTube channel. So I'm going to um, uh, mail out the, um, the precise address for this. Um, it's my great honor to introduce a center member, a fellow of the um, CWC, uh, Joe Davis, who uh, will be known to uh, all of you who have um, been in discussions in the uh, past uh, few years. And um, she, she, Joe is also now uh, a, um, a, a research fellow at the uh, uh, Johannesburg University. Um, she may be able to tell you more about this than um, uh, I'm able to do, but um, this is uh, certainly very prestigious and um, uh, also gives her access, of course, to the, um, uh, to the current discourse that you have in uh, post-apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, since. We have already advanced into the hour, and since uh, Joe's paper is uh, uh, of some length, <laughs> yes, I'm going to pass over the word to her. Um, uh, there will be a PowerPoint. She's in control of the um, uh, the, um, the right buttons, uh, so I'm going to pass over the word and the controls to um, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, and yeah, it's a, a wonderful um, to be able to um, share with you some of the work that I've been busy with in my continued studies of, of the Reverend Teo Soga. Um, and thank you so much to, to everyone who has come to, to listen. I'm just going to share my screen quickly to say, there we go. There we go. Okay, so um, I've been working on Sorga studies for the past nearly 20 years, giving away my age now, um, and always finding new perspectives and information, including sometimes speeches and pamphlets. Um, I'm still looking for the sermons and hymns, though, so if you ever do find them or see mention of them, please uh, alert me immediately. Um, so today's paper concerns my study of Sorga's biblical hermeneutics because I'm really keen to know more about his philosophies and how uh, they work. I am using literary analysis to do that chiefly by arguing that if we identify Sorga's tropes we will be able to read his ideologies because ideology resides in the sign uh, and certainly uh, Sorga used a lot of signs. This model is Derridian in that the sign exists, it argues that the sign exists independently of ideology and can be invested with ideology as per, per the choice of the chooser. Uh, and I hope to answer many questions about Sorga in this way. So as many of you know, the Reverend Teo Sorga hailed from the Tlosa people in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, and he was ordained in Edinburgh in the United Presbyterian Church of Scotland, the UPC, at Christmas in 1856, after his decade-long higher degree and theological training in Scotland, and he became a missionary to the Tlosa people in March the next year. And here's just some uh, lingo for us, that he's a Tlosa minister, he first taught at Mgwali, and then um, he moved to Tutilka, also spelled Tutilka, uh, where he died in 1871, aged nearly 40 years. And here's a map that shows you uh, where he was in um, He was uh, Mgwali, is if you can have a look along the coast of my map, you'll see that in Mubai or Fish River, um, and Mgwali's up 
up that river in a mess of purple and blue. Um, and then Tuchucha is up off the Ingliba River, which is the fish river in Kosa. Tuchucha is, how do, can you see my cursor? That, yes. That's Tuchucha. Sorry, I should have thought of that. Here's Mgwali and here's Tuchucha. And so those are the two mission stations that he founded, two or four he founded, uh, the ones that he actually worked in. Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> um, and just a quick note of where that is in relation to the Cape Colony. Um, so Chuchucha is just outside of the neutral territory. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mgwali is just outside of the neutral territory here, just below where it says Tembu. And here is um, underneath the, the direction vein, northwest, south and east, is where Chuchucha is. So he's outside of the Cape Colony for most of his life. He deals with the Cape Colony, but he's not actually ever a, um, a subject of the of the British Empire. And we can d debate about that um, at length another time, if you like. People always ask me about the maps. Anyway, so um, so two years into his missionary work in Mgwali in December, on December the 3rd, 1859, Reverend Sorga noted in his journal, never preached more wretchedly. Indeed, I am never pleased with my preaching unless I have carefully and fully prepared my forenoon closer discourse. This unhappy entry has long turned in my mind. Was it possible that Sorga, that most thorough of wordsmiths, had arrived at church unprepared? What had made him so wretched? Sorga's entry continues that a large group of people from five miles north of the station, many unconverted, had unexpectedly attended that forenoon service, and so that the church was crowded to excess and some could not gain admittance. Were these visitors arguably the most pressing subjects of millinery and mission work, those for whom he had failed to prepare? And if so, how had he fallen short of his task? How did he adapt his sermon for both his expected and unexpected congregants? And which corrective measures did he adopt for his future sermons? Knowing which so stories Sorga found useful for conversions and how he presented these to his congregations may reveal many aspects relevant to contemporary religious study of African Christianity and the history of Christianity in Africa or at least one tiny part of it. I support Wimbush's assertion that detailed exegetical treatments of the raw materials of the African experience of this period are in order. Indeed, one ponders constantly, what are the resonances in Sorga's exegetical treatments, the repetitions, the divergences? The study of Sorga's biblical hermeneutics also speaks to contemporary queries on the natures of and relationships between Black theology, African Christianity, and liberation theology. I am also intrigued that Sorga's hermeneutics would have informed his contemporary African American clergy, Cremel and Garnet, who pondered how Christianity would function in the 19th century were it to be realized and not deferred a deferred dream to be. These theologians queried the forms Christianity would take in the event of black ministers leading African congregations how worship and the place of the Bible within that would be structured, how converts might shape the meanings, what churches would look like, and how African sociologies would be affected. Soga was the living answer to these questions, and he actually answered them twice over. Both Mgwali and Tutuha were built from scratch in very different ways. The most definitive way to understand which scriptures Soga felt to be the most compelling for his sermons would be to read those prepared discourses. However, these are not currently in the public domain. But Sorga remains a forefather and leader, and his choices have broader implications, and so I could not let it rest there. I followed the advice of Sorga's 20th century scholar, the late Donovan Williams, and set to assembling the texts Sorga used when he preached, which may, he felt, be significant for a number of studies. Sorga's noting of scriptural passages in his letters or reports shows his belief that his remote readers would infer the specific significance he brought to each passage by intertextual allusion. It shows Sorga felt that knowledge was held in common with his globalized Christian community. 
that should still be true today. Of course, the ser sermons themselves would have been different to the scriptures around which they were based, as stories wound around and elaborated scriptural passages, which Hendricks reminds us so beautifully, could be infinite. But this is better than no answers at all. I assembled all Sorga's Sabbath entries in William's edited works, which typically gave the date and location of the Sabbath, the scriptural passages used, languages, congregation sizes, amounts taken in collection, and baptisms. I verified Bible chapters and chapter and verse numbers against Sorga's actual handwritten journal and included scriptures Sorga mentioned in his missionary reports and letters to friends published in the missionary record. I read newspapers for summaries of Sorga's guest sermons, especially when fundraising for bigger buildings. However, while there were summaries for white missionaries who visited the four big towns in the Cape Colony from remote stations, I found none for Sorga. However, that doesn't mean he didn't do any. It just means they didn't uh, publish them. <laughs> However, Sorga's work requires... Ah, oh, so it does block it. Sorry, guys, I didn't realize. However, Sorga's work, Sorga's work required two separate contexts for ministry. The first based at the mission station, sermonizing at the pulpit within the buildings of the church. And the second as missionary, actively going out to preach both to prior and potential converts. I then turned to reports sent to the missionary record for accounts of his preaching out of visiting Tulsa communities to preach. Sorga's handwritten journal records the dates of visits he made either alone or accompanied with up to three fellow itinerants and travel attendants, um, ashamed to say always nameless, and the names of people they have seen. It is in his letters to friends in Scotland and his reports to the MRUPC that he provides the actual detail of those journeys. And in terms of the content, we see Sorga preaching very similar content to that which occurs in the pulpit, but without basing his knowledge in an evident sermon and never recording a scriptural reference. Symbolically, these conversations take place without the overdetermination of religious artifacts, which may be interpreted as being aligned with Western culture such as the actual church itself, or the books, or the prayers, or the very routine to which Christians in the church services may look to for reassurance. And I argue this shows Christianity recontextualized within the African context. There are two, these are two distinct liturgical practices and have different manifestations as I shall pursue. But briefly, before I go into talking about those, there are two important influences in Sorga's liturgical practices. Firstly, Sorga's position as a Tulsa man within a Tulsa tradition is inviolate. Sorga was raised within this community and culture and was never estranged from Tulsa people. He was absent from South Africa for the best part of a decade, but he was never removed or held apart from the Tulsa community. The discursive techniques he used were not in any way foreign to him. And I think that's really, really important. The second influence is the theological education at the Seminary for Ministers in the UPC at Theological Hall, Queen Street, Edinburgh, if I may infer from the curriculum for 1849, three years before Sorga began his studies. This curriculum was steeped in Scottish Presbyterianism and gave Sorga a broad sweeping and expert understanding of Christian doctrine and history. One of the lecturers, the Reverend John Brown, described it as of the highest possible standard in Scotland. And indeed, it appears an exhaustive curriculum which aimed to empower ministers to render the mind of the spirit intelligible to others. It was a four year, five year session course running through August and September for eight weeks to which a student gained entry only after a tough exam. Just to get in it was a tough exam. Then two hours of lectures per day were held in the first session and then three. Each year, the course comprised classes on the biblical languages, Greek, Latin and Hebrew, uh, and also theology, biblical hermeneutics, that is the history of biblical interpretation and the history of Christianity especially the Reformation, as well as classes on the writing of several kinds of discourse, from the humble homily in the first year to the ecclesiastical exercise, 
or Scottish critical dissertation in their second year to finally a full sermon. During the other 10 months of the year, students were required to present a sermon every three months within their presbytery. This information speaks to the question of the excellence which Sorga brought to his work. It is so gratifying to see Reverend Sorga's name. It's the 12th name on the list under MacDonald. There he is, Tio Sorga from, and you can speak, they spelt it without the I. T.Y.O. from Crefraria, missionary in Cathland, died 18th August 1871. It is so gratifying to see Reverend Sorga's name in 1852 as the first year uh, student of theology and it's here you can see lists of students of theology that's the beginning of the list from page 695 and that was from 693 oh, 696 sorry about that uh, to learn the names of his professors who taught him and their fields of expertise and here they are Dr. John Brown, who was the one who said it was such a good course, James Harper, Reverend Neil McNeil, McMichael, uh, William Lindsay, who is my personal favorite. He is the father of the bride of William Chalmers, who, uh, sorry, John Aitken Chalmers, who is Sorga's biographer. Uh, and his daughter died in childbirth uh, 11 months after leaving his home to go to join um, uh, uh, John Aitken Chalmers, and I have always just had a huge respect for him. He, 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 he's an important person as well. Um, and then John Edie. And this is, these are, you know, these are Sorga's, the teachers, these are the people who trained him uh, in their fields of expertise. I have not located Sorga's academic marks. However, he was ordained as a minister and received his license to preach on the 23rd of December, 1856. If he had not passed, they would not have ordained him. Alongside these studies, Sorga also took medical classes at the Andersonian University. Uh, um, and this is very, very small. At the top of this page, you can see catalog of students attending the medical school at the Anderson Institute. And the bottom of the page here, you can see third from the bottom, C Sorga, T, Negro, Missions, Africa. That, there he is. Now, he studied anatomy and materia medica, now called pharmacology, uh, and he was very involved in inoculating people against the smallpox. So a third influence on, oh, hang on, let me stop sharing for a bit. There we go. A third influence uh, on Sorga's biblical hermeneutics is the Moravian, eth uh, the Moravian ethos. The history of the Moravian church in South Africa contains many keys to the history of Christianity in Tulsa and Gunakwa communities, commencing in the unlikely early period of 17, 1742, with the arrival of possibly the first ever Moravian missionary, George Schmidt from Transylvania where the church was founded in Baviaanskloof, also called Genadendal. And I have a map of Genadendal for you. There we go. There we go. So LM9, if you can see at the bottom next to Cape Town, you can see LM9, there are two uh, turquoise um, Arrows, LM9 is, is Genardendal or Bavianskloer. Schmidt baptized six converts and educated many others in Dutch before returning to Europe in 1746. I believe that it is he who derived the god name Tito and others with the Gunokwa peoples, which were taken up in Kosa. Kosa people were also in that congregation, even that far south. I omit a long and deeply fascinating story here in the interests of brevity. The next three Moravian missionaries arrived in the 1790s and established two further stations, Elam, which is that LM103 just down from LM9, and then Enon, LM63, which is up behind Bethelsdorf here. And Mgwali is SU12. Can you see uh, SU12 there? So the, 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 once they get to Elam, uh, Enon, they're right in the heart of, of, of being able to preach to closer people very easily. Van de Kemp 
their exact contemporary appears not to have known about the Moravian settlements just around the corner. And in 1826, 10 years after the first Glasgow African Missionary Society missionary, and just as the first Wesleyans arrived, Shiloh, which is LM13, and is right, like you can walk to Shiloh from Mgwali in less than a morning, uh, was established in, Gal in Galeka land. The Moravians were far more settled than the Scottish Presbyterians or the LMS missionaries seem to have known or admitted in their writings. No one has acknowledged their presence, but I submit that their significance is huge. The Moravians, alone of all the missionary societies, it seems, also published guidance for their missionaries uh, in, in, 18, in 1784, firstly, and then again in 1814 which guidance seems to me to cohere directly with Sorga's practices of preaching out. So let's just quickly have a look at the Moravian way. I am paraphrasing here a 50 page booklet, uh, which I must say makes for brilliant reading, <laughs> really. Uh, and, and it basically says, tell the theology of the good news first, then Jesus, then God, and then the Holy Spirit. So you preach by walk and conversation, preach for, of Jesus Christ, his love to man, because love for Jesus is the aim of the Moravians. Then you tell a father in the heaven, the son is the emissar giving everlasting life. Note, those who refuse are going to hell. There's no, there's no equivocal, there's no niceness left there. After Jesus, you preach about God, the father in heaven, then the Holy Ghost. Missionaries must desire the heathens to be saved. They must declare God's greatness, beg them not to do bad things, remind that forgiveness comes, and gain hearts. Most important, always gain hearts. Always learn. Oh, so these numbers in the corner here, those are the, the instruction numbers, but the page references are the ones that say PP 17 to 18 at the end of each one. 24, uh, always base the learning in the person of Jesus and prepare for evil spirits which may become enraged by the advent of good. Choose assistants, train them. They may be more useful as messengers. And this one is something that Sorga employed directly and to very good effect. They also advise that if you learn scripture off by heart, that will be a very good way of keeping the people um, having access to the scripture. If only a few of the grown people learn to read, the rest will benefit also. Um, and this is true with the study of the Moravian um, settlements. You can see how the first people who were educated in literacy and learned to read passed that story on and the vestiges of that narrative that run across sort of 180 years, literally. It's unbelievably fascinating. Remember number seven, also remember we are all sinners and all unworthy of grace and do not be glorious in self or self-congratulatory. That doesn't really impact much on the mission work, but it does impact on how we see uh, what has been called Sorga's Ignatian doubt. Because if he's actually just remembering to be unworthy and to not be self-congratulatory, then he's no longer a victim of uh, doubt. He's in fact even more ardently Christian than before. And I think that that is important. So, uh, turning to um, Sorga's discursive practices, let us start with an assessment of his scriptural passages. This uh, um, get, um, picture that I've got here, this graph that I've got here, is back to front. It should be the Old Testament first and then the New Testament, but I put all the New Testament pieces in on the left accidentally. He used a roughly 65-35% split between the New and the Old Testaments, favoring in the Old Testament the Psalms, without which there is a clear New Testament bias. Although Sorga did um, omit scriptural references for 20 Sabbaths, so these figures are short by between 50 and 100 sermons. Of those recorded, Sorga used unique scriptures for each sermon aside from thrice, i.e. six sermons, so that book of sermons will be fairly fat when we find it. This chart is color coded by author and all the gray areas here are Pauline, letters to Corinthians, Thessalonians, Romans, and books which have to do with Paul, Acts and Hebrews. 
Assessing the dates of entries shows that Sorga only made entries between 57 and 63, and then 69 and his death in, in 71. These are the early years at Mbwali and at Chitilpa. Like Paul, Sorga seeks to build a community which will operate to a new, culturally distinct set of values in a situation of newness where all are new, in a fairly antagonistic context where faith and love are the guiding principles and which is characterized by its reception of mercy. He says, once you are not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Sorga chooses scriptures about the constitution of this people as multicultural. The many rooms in my father's house to which John refers afford difference within unity. Hebrews 5 verse 4 stresses God's choice in those who follow him, which underscores the equality between black and white. Sorga highlights in Romans 8.30 that those whom God predestined he called, and those he also justified, and those he also glorified. God's prerogative here shows that irrespective of skin color, all are equal, a fairly radical point to expound for Sorga's milieu, although he did uphold ethnic specificity, for example, using the prayer and hymn written by one of his earliest Christian converts, Ntsikana. Sorry, not his, but one of the earliest Christian con converts. Ntsikana was, uh, had died before Sorga was born, to gather closer crowds as a unifier of voice. The homeland for this chosen nation is a metaphorical heavenly country and city, which Sorga calls Zion and the house of Israel. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in, his, to, in their king. But avoids the politically charged and divisive issue of land expropriation and annexation of the Cape Colony, Botswana, and of the Transkei, then highly topical with several mentions per edition of the local broadsheets. Sorga chooses scriptures on how to be as this community and promotes qualities of peace, love and mercy with this new lifestyle, new behavioral codes around interpersonal relationships in which status is not derived by age, gender or history, but by equality within the experience of the divine. He has scriptures on withstanding discrimination and even persecution. Um, let me just see if I've got another one for you. There we go. Oops. He has scriptures on withstanding persecution and discrimination, parables, especially from Matthew, like that of the ten virgins, virgins, the narrow way and gate versus the broad way and gate, foreground the need to remain steadfast in Christian belief and practice. Sorga presented scripture on the non-hierarchical leadership of the church body, stressing the equality of the congregants with ministers who he perceived as servants to the community, albeit chosen by God and not self-appointed, and church elders. The one-point form sermon given in his journal concerns how to harden one's heart against the word of God. Sorga loved to argue by ironic inversion, and so again I see this as his signature wry intellectualism. Like Paul, Sorga refused a patriarchal authority or role. Church elders could do the work of a missionary, go on long itineraries either with Sorga or independently, and lead the sunrise sermon and prayer. The only authority in the mission station was God, represented by Jesus. The only important person is the individual in his or her relationship with God. The scriptures focused on family relationships as the bedrock of this new community. Families were treated as units of equal entities. He says, within six months of starting his, oh, sorry, within six months of starting his ministerial career, Sorga noted for the first time the plan of people sitting in uh, a house of God by families was introduced today, and it was so easy, simple, and becoming that is a, that it is a wonder the first missionaries did not introduce it earlier among the people and that generally in our stations, the families are still divided in God's house. Sorga notes baptisms of infants, naming each child and the parents, initially every two to three months, but at, with once an eight month break, but soon baptisms occur each month. This reflects an increase in both the population and at the mission station and in the conviction of those congregants.
Soga presents scripture around building of actual church buildings, which he undertook three times in 14 years, most arduously, specifically at or on the laying of foundation and cornerstones. So this metaphor uh, from Ephesians 2.19 is deeply apt. Soga preaches from verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Uh, but verses 20 and 22 continue built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone um, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is one of two sermons given twice, both on the same day, the 5th of October, 1862. So in June of that year, Sorga had also sardonically indicated the need for that new building. But will God indeed dwell with man on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven contain you. It cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Um, that's from 2 Chronicles 6.18. He notes that the acquisition of a bell for the church at Chichucha was cause for celebration, with the congregation singing to call others to church. Psalm 122 verses 6 to 9 was given for both the services, celebrating the laying the foundation stone of the second church and for his final service at Mwali before leaving for Chichucha in 1867. Whether this was deliberate needs investigation. I predict that this was a key motif in his guest sermons in the Cape Colony. Now, Psalm is, is the book from which Sorga takes the single biggest quantity of scriptures, but always of praise and worship, not one single lament. Uh, only he ever talks about way, providing ways to be joyful and rejoice. He also has several scriptures on the nature of Jesus as the true vine or bedrock of the community the shepherd, the healer, the human. Romans 4.25 stresses that the whole point of Jesus is the people, not himself. Revelations 3.34 grants Jesus as a person who could knock on the door and come in to eat. Scriptures on Jesus as equivalent to God and on the central tenets of Christianity, particularly the resurrection, death, and also peace, and of course salvation, all inform the individual's choice and direct relationship with God and Jesus. Several passages describe the Holy Spirit not as an entity, but a metaphor either for a higher spiritual consciousness or soul, or for binding a community together, such as speaking in tongues, for example. These chosen scriptures consistently concern achieving safety, peace, love, and cement the cohesiveness of this fledgling and fragile community, persuading, maintaining, and nurturing it. Now, several glaring omissions are notable. Firstly, aside from baptism, the performative aspects of religion are absent. Sorga records no services for Christmas or Easter, even though he does record uh, their de the, the, the date in his journal, and only one burial, even though he wrote on this in other places. Sorga based his one Jeremiah reading on New Year's morning in 1860 on, therefore says the Lord, Behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you will die because you uttered rebellion against the Lord, <laughs> which I find so awry. Quarterly communication, communions were sometimes but not frequently observed. There is no angelology aside from once on the resurrection. One scripture is on the fall and the final entry in the journal is on the temptation of Jesus in the desert. Otherwise, Satan, the devil and issues of sin are not used. No miracles. He is not miraculous. There's no suffering, no turbulence, no endurance, no scriptures on the Decalogue, no hell, no sin, no fear, nothing which could present an ontological clash or cognitive dissonance. There is also an omission of hermeneutic strategies associated with African Christianity. I find no accommodation, although Sorga always insisted on the importance of respect for the chiefs and members of their broader society, irrespective of religious affiliation. Nor did he use indigenization. The philosophical borders of this new Christian community were always drawn as new and distinct, possibly because conversion was evidenced performatively by adopting a different behavior. I even feel that Sorga did not experience enculturation, 
his multiculturalism and globalized knowledge bases may infer enculturation through his enjoyment of expanded fields of consciousness, but Sorge never lost his closer culture. Likewise, the scriptures Sorge chose avoid syncretic agreements, even where these appear useful, such as with Lobola, a dowry and trousseau combined, polygamy or marriage of widowed women. Sorge never exploits congruence between Christian and Tulsa philosophies. He does not use adaptation, and I think he avoided incarnation because of the appearance of numerous prophets within Tulsa, the Tulsa community, Ngwele, Mflakaza, Ngawuse, and others. Sorge used no scriptures which might lead to an ontological difference or cognitive dissonance beside the immediate question of accepting the love of God. There are pivotally no references to black theology as seen in the 19th century African-American ministries. No basis of any sermon is influenced by hermetic discussions. There's no leading out exilic narrative, no discussions of slavery or of the special position of Africa within the history of Christianity and within the Bible, which we have seen from um, the, the class um, year curriculum he definitely knew about. Where the recent, uh, there are no passages of escape from bondage, uh, no salvation, no pharaonic metaphors, only redemption, which is personal, individual, and metaphysical. The direct oppositionality and group, group solidarity of the African American theologians like Henry Highland Garnett is absent. There is no mention of the eunuch. In several of Sorge's letters to the press, written under a pseudonym, we see a strident political voice, but these scriptures show Sorge more like Frederick Douglass. Bayetta notes that the aspiration of progressive Christians has been that people recognize themselves as belonging to one and the same humanity which God shaped in his own image and which his son died to redeem. Sorge seems to have been progressive even 150 years earlier. Yet this is a startling finding because South Africa became leaders in liberation theory, not even a century later. Theology, sorry, liberation theology. The first clear conclusion I can draw between Sorge's hermeneutics and the hermeneutics of black theology is that Sorge did not seek to relocate his community and start it anew. As for black theology, theologians, by entreating congregants to pursue personal freedoms in a promised land, he was already in the promised land and he called it that. Nor did he ever advocate that people rise now and fly to arms, as had Reverend Dr. Henry Highland Garnet. His was a community establishing itself and going about its business, providing benefits for those who would join in return for several performed behavioral ch changes, <clears throat> and ideally a professed conversion to Christianity, but not. It wasn't a law that you had to profess Christianity. You just had to, it was hoped, they hoped you would. He was, uh, where am I? Another crucial difference was that African-Americans achieved only illegal access to the Bible and literacy. Whereas in Africa, the Bible was forcibly inserted into people's lives. Churches and schools popped up all over and upheld education and literacy as imperative. That's totally not different from what happened in America. Neither is there any sign of liberation th theology with its socialist focus on spiritual richness and physical poverty and attaining awareness of one's social status or political position as intersectional, that is, that one's lot in life is actually the byproduct of a system of structural empowerment and disempowerment, not of predestination or biology. A century later, South Africans did use liberations theology, liberation theology, but in Sorge's context, while unconverted Tulsa people were increasingly impoverished through colonial displacement, they were not slaves as for the African-American context, where people had no rights and no land. In fact, none of the labels for the types of African Christianities with which we currently work appear to apply to Sorge's work or hermeneutics in any way, most probably because of his earliness according to the scholarship on African Christianity, which is not the same as the standards of Christian mission history, already almost 2000 years after Paul by Sorge's era, neither early by the standards of African Christianity as David Killingreal's research on African and West African clergy in the 17th, 18th and 19th century shows. And indeed, when one starts to seek Sorge's hermeneutics within this mission work, a whole new field of itineration studies, or as Sorge called it, preaching out, 
opens up for an explanation of evangelism in the African context. Itineration is looked down on as the unqualified, spontaneous, self-appointed version of preaching, and itinerants are viewed as helpful if unqualified but wildly enthusiastic lay preachers, as in the case of Colonel Malan, whose furlough rides through the mission fields of South Africa between the Kai and Bashi rivers detail exactly this phenomenon. But preaching out signifies something much more for Sorga. It is a tool of evangelization and casts a decidedly apostolic light on Sorga's work and mission ethos. Sorga soon set up a routine of frequent itineration trips, and he soon showed a great enjoyment for them. In every year, almost all year through, he moved in a 10 to 12 mile radius, east and north, meeting people and preaching to groups ranging from 25 to 500 souls large. Tuesdays were his days for itinerating in a normal week, but sometimes he would go for weeks at a time, once three months. Sorga frequently refers to his itinerary experience as an important and normalized aspect of this work, even when it has been neglected for for some time, my itinerating has been interrupted by the sickness of all my horses. But the elders Dukwana, Festiri and Gaza go out regularly on the Sabbath and meet with the people in the kraals fixed upon for this purpose. There are several advantages to this type of preaching. First, as is evident in this last quote, Sorga could unite all of the longest standing Christians of several decades standing as his elders in a strong network. And here they are for anyone who would like to take a photograph or just somehow screenshot that. Uh, that's a result of many <laughs> years of careful scholarship collecting these names. Uh, Sorga described these men even to chiefs as his mouth, hands and legs in the furtherance of his work. This permits an interchangeable center of, of authority. If for any reason one was unable to work, the work itself could continue further together. They could reach more than far more people far more quickly than in the church itself and thereby extend the influence of our little church by the labors of the native agency brought to bear and statedly on the heathen, directly and statedly on the heathen. So he notes that um, the elders have been enabled uh, throughout the year to continue their work without interruptions. Sorga does not record the content of the itinerations of his elders, uh, but he records his. Some whole reports are about itinerating on a grand scale. Sorga has preached on love and mercy, righteousness, temperance and judgment, and discusses the color of people, the fall and sin and redemption, and he's chiefly recording the gospel as in the news of salvation from sin and everlasting life and on mortality of the soul through the death of the Son of God, the great mystery of godliness. He has only the Bible as text, but again, Sorga does not tell the stories of the parables, just the central ethos of Christianity as the Moravians had outlined should be done. These discourses were essentially dialogistic, conversations which became at times negotiations with chiefs, but Sorga knew the pomp and ceremony around the speech acts in noble situations and was not nonplussed. Rather, he knew when the speech act could be competitive even with the chief and how to use his religious knowledge or to challenge chiefs to answer back, even contradict, or answer in a forceful way, or deliver comments on the chief's ideas or modes of being. Preaching out also allows Sorga to record conversations with ordinary people held either during his sermonizing or occasioned by his travels, which provide opportunities of unfolding the message of life to men who then spiritually as well as physically were in very destitute circumstances indeed. They heard us willingly, he says. The discursive opportunities of these conversations allow people to ask questions or perplex, perplex me further and thus enable him to enable them in their knowledge requirements. One woman asks him, servant of God, don't give up speaking to us, though we are deaf. He likes these. Reading the conversations is like watching the movie Mind Walk. The plot is the unfolding of knowledge in conversation. He records them without speech marks, so one reads slowly to see which speaker is the only of, owner of any given utterance. Sogo also records prayers of Christians, and he can use itinerary journeys to establish where people are 
in their being shipped about by the colonial office to extend membership certificates where these are needed. If no one comes to hear him preaching, Solga can actually go and fetch them. In itinerating, he says, among my countrymen, one requires to assume a degree of courage by at once going personally from hut to hut, trucking out the reluctant inmates. Otherwise, you would often have to wait long for an audience. It also permits nonverbal communication. Sorgo would still give sermons, especially if he stayed overnight. For example, he visited and preached at the native church in PE. And I feel certain that these discourses would also have adopted the call and response patterns he had established with people to ask their questions. I wonder whether these conversations did not also shape and form the sermons Sorgo pre prepared for the church services as well. What arises, therefore, is a hermeneutic of polyvocality, even polyphony, a community of making meaning together. These sermons were bookish in the sense that they relied on Sorga's extensive expertise to enable him to respond to a broad range of questions from a broad range of knowledge bases with respect for the status of interlocutors, which Sorga was able to do because uniquely and fortunately he was a missionary to his own people. This gave him a confident authority and language which, could scarce, which others could scarcely hope to achieve in a lifetime. But this sermonizing is bookish without a book. It requires extemporaneous delivery based on the knowledge. It is the execution of that knowledge that Stoga provides, the spoken tradition and persuasion. Felder mentions our viewpoint depends more on what is heard, and this may be similar to an oral hermeneutic in which the texts were read more than, uh, heard more than read, they were engaged as stories that seized and freed the imagination. In, in seeking to read Sorga's biblical hermeneutics as interpersonal and performative rather than intrapersonal, I am asking us to consider that the idea of interpretation ought to include the idea of discernment, of interpretation as a framing device, of relaying the message, framing and distributing it, rather than um, anything else, choosing an interpretation which will meet the needs of one's audience rather than the sender. I always worry that it is tautological to talk about biblical hermeneutics, seeing as the term hermeneutics refers specifically to the discussions of biblical stories and their reinterpretation in different contexts, or at the very least that biblical hermeneutics must be the high church of literary analysis, and it is even more tautological to talk of black biblical hermeneutics as if these literary manifestations had no ordinary place in the discussion of the ways in which these interpretations were made. There are other theorists who have mentioned this, I know. But perhaps in this instance we would need to stretch the potential of the name to incorporate present, uh, presentation possibilities in the history of using the Bible to create new meanings. Sorga is clearly using a range of influences as well, working with different manifestations of Christianity and knowledges he has to serve his community to the best of his ability. Does this amount to a rejection of dominant Western theological paradigms and an acceptance of African realities and worldview in theological hermeneutics? Or is it a pacification of Tulsa culture, an uncritical acceptance of a foreign methodology? I don't know. I think this shows Sorga's firm commitment to Christianity, his conviction in salvation and redemption. He sticks so closely to Pauline messages that he's taking no chances, no risks. He has absolute faith that it will work. His theology shows that his strategy of evangelization in this social transformation is this social transformation. His commitment is to a long-term investment. To base his sermons on these scriptures, locates the ideas and knowledge within a context which is stable for the congregants and can be referenced and built on. I think it is still liberation theology, whether with capitals or not, because it is Bayeta's um, de de definition which says that theological reflection born of the experience of shared efforts to abolish the current unjust situation and, and to build a different society which is freer and more human. Uh, it, it is relevant in this way. The end. <laughs> you can't hear me. Now you can hear me. Thank you so much. Uh, th this was a, a, a very, uh, 
I, I am trying to, to find the correct terms for it. Um, as a historian, let me just say before I open the discussion, uh, as a historian, I have to say that I'm in awe of your of the uh, the, the detailed nature of your research. Uh, the maps reminded me of those drawn by my own uh, former supervisor, Gary Tiedemann, who did exactly the same. He hand uh, traced every single um, mentioning and then placed them in maps that did not exist. You know, you created your own maps, more or less. Um, uh, please don't um, um, don't die before you ever uh, put this into print and <laughs> distribute this. This is um, a really a very meticulous research that needs to be okay. followed up and, um, and published. So this is, um, I, I very much look forward to that stage. Um, the second um, thing that I want to say is also, it's almost like a um, um, the, the, the interface between uh, social anthropology and, um, and history, where you are tracing not just the, um, the individual, um, the, the, the retracing the steps of our preacher, but actually also uh, tracing the uh, connections that they had with uh, the rest of society. And this is fa fascinating. This is, uh, again, something which opens up uh, a whole uh, a, a panoply of different ways of uh, of looking at social uh, of of the social order at that point, because usually it's of course seen through the lens of the um, the, the the colonizers, um, where you have a the uh, the agency on the uh, the, the Dutch or uh, later English, uh, uh, well not only the church members but I mean the the, the colonial uh, yeah. presence uh, at that time. And then everything else is interpreted through that. This is actually um, agent with the agency firmly in the hands of uh, of a local. Um, so th this is the second point that I wanted to mention. And then the third point is the um, I'm, I'm not qualified actually for that academically, uh, but your insight into the um, uh, the theological uh, ideas of well the Moravian the the, the brothers who uh, go out and they. From my the the, the recollections of uh, the Moravians that I have, so this is this is Jan Hus who at the very beginning uh, goes out and just wants the um, the gospel to be read in uh, in the vernacular in in, in Czech yes. and then you know also in, in G German for the uh, G German parts, but um, he has these ideas that the people need to be involved, and um, uh, there you have him uh, preaching in. Xosa, is it Xosa? Is that his? Xosa, uh, yes. Yes, that, that's his um, native tongue. So that so he does that. And uh, this is the application of the same Hussite sp uh, spirit. Uh, um, to, let's say, uh, to, uh, four, 400 years later. So this is the, this is, um, uh, if, if you want to make a, a chapter out of this parallel, then I, I'd be happy to prove that. that that's, uh, <laughs> I, that's something that I find fascinating. Uh, but now I'll be quiet and I'll open up the floor to the discussion. Um, are you all um, able to unmute yourselves or do we need to do that? If you are, just click on the microphone. Yes, we, we yes. can. Yes. Huh? And uh, we are not so many. So you, I don't think we need to raise hands. You simply, you simply mm. raise your voice and then I think the, um, the, the microphone will, the, the camera will switch to you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Oh. Any questions? Oh, oh sorry. I oh, oh, I unmuted. Did, did we want I was, to stop the recording. I was me, sorry. Me, I was maybe. I unmuted. I was yes. um experimenting. But anyway, um yeah. hello Jorg. Hello everybody else. Thank you, Joe, um, for that enlightening um research, very in-depth, very thorough, etc. Um, my own research, interestingly, one of um my kind of um, speciality is on um, black homiletics, the hermeneutics of uh, black homiletics, um, particularly within the Caribbean context. Um, I do focus on the African Americans and I draw reference to the African oral tradition. So I was fascinated with um, your insights in terms of how. Um, that was used in terms of the call response elements etc so um i um that's a, a major part of my research um positioning 
call and response um, as a hermeneutical frame. So, um, you know, that's all I wanted to say. So I'd be very interested in um, looking at your research and exploring your research in more detail, um, because I think there are references to my own research um, which is located within the African Caribbean community within the UK. So I look at the diasporic communities within the UK. Wow, that's so amazing, Carol. Mm. Um, I mean, um, I, I, it's so wonderful me to, for me to, to speak with someone who also finds this ridiculously fascinating. You know? Oh, gosh, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, at the language, oh, and how he used um, the language of the community and he and his own biblical hermeneutics, um, I think, can be a model yeah. of evangelism. Yes, it can. I really do. Be, so there's a big yes. disjuncture here. Yeah. Mm. Between, so what? There's a big just there's 40 years that are vacuumed out of his. Yes. Well, actually, this was vacuumed out too, right? Yes. <laughs> so there's exactly. more than 40. There's like 200. But right. as I start to put it back together, so there's there's 40 years between when he dies and when the African Indian yes. churches in South Africa are really mm. taking off. Um, and in the mm. middle there, Nat Turner who is yes. the, the African-American Presbyterian yes. arrives in South All Africa. Right. I believe that um, Sorga's children, used, yes. I've written about this before, used his um, techniques as well. And the young, the oldest right. son went on to have these three day long shebangs oh, with wow. feasting, and dancing and yes uh, and that evangelism was a kind of revi revival moment yes 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 it's got revivalist overtones to it yes yes the younger yes. son the second son who his name was oh. john he didn't oh. go in for it much but he was more of a bookish lad right okay <laughs> I okay to the three-day party like for him right be, like books for three days would be a good yes day. Okay. But, but yes, I think it's a really, really, I mean, I, 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 that's where I need to go next. And I also think that Sorga yeah. had connections with the West Indies. He knew, yes. he knew about the Afro-Caribbean situation. Yes. Henry Highland Garnet, uh -huh. he was known to Sorga. He was ordained in the same church as Sorga. He was two years previous to Sorga. Oh. I think that Sorga was betrothed to a woman that uh, Garnet looked after, who was a, oh. a, a, a self-manumitted um, woman. Her name was Stella Vimes, or Weems. Oh. Um, and he and she were in... Um, Jamaica in 1853. All oh. oh, right. So there are really important connections, connections. which are globalized. I'm sure right. If we spin them back to Jamaica, we can spin yeah. them out to India and to China. Yes. Too. Yes. Fascinating. Well, I'd like to connect with you. I think, oh, I'll contact Jenny to um, get your email. I think that would be right. useful. Um, I think Jorg would agree with that. Um, I think um, that Cambridge? would be um, no, but I'm connected to Cambridge via York. Um, I, <laughs> I did a paper for York at Cambridge, but um, I'm not um, at this moment in time in, at Cambridge. So thank you. Thank you. I thank you so much. For you. Yes, likewise. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, <laughs> Very good. I, I, I just, I think I'll switch off the the, uh, the recording now. But um, so, uh, but because we've got the full hour, but uh, we we will be continuing until the cows go home. That's uh, that. Uh, uh, and then let me just see whether I can switch it off without actually.